Yo, hello, hello. Welcome to the elephant in the room. My name is Aaron and in today's video, I think you probably know it already, we will continue with the chapter Systems to Organize Societies from the book The Money Game and Beyond. Alright, so I want to start today's video with an article that I came across from netspolitik.org which is a website and they publish posts about IT security and privacy etc. And um, yeah, maybe more and more people realize or understand that data trade, that companies are collecting their data and selling it to advertisers, also maybe because of the Netflix documentary um, The Social Dilemma. So there's more um, public awareness and then the companies think, oh, okay, so we should do something about that to not lose customers. So what Apple did is they um, claim themselves to be a privacy caring company. They introduced several um, guidelines, labels, um, policies, etc. Um, to not lose the trust of their customers because of course they, they want to keep um, you as an Apple user, right? Um, but it just turned out that um, they don't take their policies not that seriously or the, the apps on the, on the App Store. Because here in that article they say um, they checked different apps from the App Store and 80% of them, of the apps they investigated that supposedly didn't collect any data did they did track people they did collect their data and um, it's just interesting because you might be like yeah okay I, I trust Apple this this huge company that takes privacy seriously I really trust them and now it just turned out it's a lie <laughs> it's a fucking lie um, it's just to me it, this is a, a great example how you cannot trust any any big company because they all have these shady practices you know they all promote themselves as yeah we care about you we take things serious and um, yeah but in the end they just care about their profits that's the the purpose of a company that's the incentive of a company here they also have some guidelines if you um, submit an app to the App Store it should not it should respect the the data collection um, guideline etc but then some um, I think students from a university they did a study it's this one uh, which is about our iPhones really better for privacy a comparative study of iOS and Android apps and it turned out <laughs> here in the summary which is here the conclusion while it has been argued that the choice of smartphone architecture might protect user privacy no clear winner between ios and android emerges from our analysis and then also here it says across all studied apps our study highlights widespread potential infringements of US, EU and UK data protection and privacy laws. So in the end they don't give a shit about any rules that the EU or UK or US came up with. You know there's the GDPR from Europe but of course they, <laughs> they don't give a shit because that um, would mean that they would lose profits and that's not what they like because they are a company and this is nothing surprising you you might be like wow this is this is crazy but this is nothing surprising because google did this for decades they are doing this for decades in this article from private internet access um, they revealed in 2015 already that um, news broke that Google has been stealth downloading audio listeners onto every computer that runs Chrome and transmit audio data back to Google. Effectively, this means that Google had taken itself the right to listen to every conversation in every room that runs Chrome somewhere 
without any kind of consent from the people eavesdropped on. In official statements, Google shrugged off the practice with what amounts to we can do that. So basically Google said, well, we are able to collect all that data and um, listen to every conversation in every room that runs Chrome somewhere. And yeah, we just do that <laughs> because we can. <laughs> and um, this is just to me, it's like, this is idiocracy and this is this is so isn't there a bigger scam like how can you sell or, or say to people well we care about privacy but then you don't but we should not be surprised by that because that's just how this game works this is the the game of trade that we play because companies have an incentive to 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 put profit above everything else so they try to find every way of doing that and if it means to spy on people, if it means to collect data from people, then they will just do that. And um, yeah, then I also listened to this conversation and this was interesting because uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger is talking about civilization is making us sick. But is it really civilization or is it what is the, the the structure of our civilization and this is just trade in that interview they are not really talking about trade and this is something that i that i keep missing in conversations yes the world is so fucked up companies are scamming people are lying are doing shady practices front left right and center but why because of this trade game that we play you have to zoom out and look on planet earth from an alien perspective and then I think you will realize, because then you will see in China, in US, in, in Germany, in Switzerland, in Africa, people are trading, 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 trading every day. And there are so many different kinds of trade and they have negative consequences, negative aspects. And this is the thing that people should get. <laughs> this is the, the reason why I do these videos. And then we need to find out, okay, how can we get, go beyond this game? And this is why we need to, yeah, discuss about other approaches how we can organize ourselves. And in the last video, we had a discussion about different ideas. We had the sharing and gift economies, um, the decentralized guy and the open source guy. And we also had the technocracy guy. And they had very interesting um, approaches, ideas, and let's look how they try to implement that. So we will start with technocracy. The old dude is saying, what is interesting this time, kid, is that these folks are all focusing around science and technology. So they understand that we can not refuse technology and science because they are a way forward. Um, with no science and technology, we, we cannot organize anything. And it happened that in the beginning of the 20th um, century, the shift was towards the scientific and technological domains due to their rapid growth and development. But these people had different approaches. First, technocracy envisions a more rigid and centralized mode of organizing society around science and technology, while the other ones, open source, sharing and gift economy and decentralized, believe it works best as a complete decentralization of technology and scientific research, a more chaotic integration of them based on a few rules that will exponentially spark great progress and stability. So the two different approaches around science and technology. So let's start with technocracy. The technocracy movement was started in the United States around 1919 by a group of scientists impressed by the results of the mobilization of resources and production during the First World War. So basically they've seen that isn't it crazy that we can produce so many weapons, so many war gadgets, airplanes, um, it, just because it's war and we have all that economic on that technological development, um, that power as well. 
and it became more visible during America's Great Depression in 1930 after the money system had crashed and the technocracy movement proposed a bold replacement of politicians with their system of engineers and scientists. So they have seen that politicians really have no clue. We need to replace them with engineers and scientists. Their plan was specific to the North American tribes, USA, Canada and Mexico rather than worldwide. They conducted a survey of America's energy and natural resources and studied the corresponding industrial evolution that unfolded post World War I. The group's aim was to design a new system of production and distribution for North America that would provide a better standard of living for people while conserving non-renewable resources ensuring an economy of abundance. And the kid is now asking, hold on, North America, not worldwide? And the old dude answers, yes, that's a region on earth. They said they were choosing this location alone because it was the only one capable of achieving this abundance through technology. Military power, therefore, was a must to protect it from the rest of the world. But they planned that once this system was in place and working, they would freely help the other nations to achieve this goal as well. The kid says, I foresee problems with this approach of separating yourself from the rest. You cannot just like build a world of abundance in your country and the other ones don't have that because they might be envy of you, they might want to invade you or whatever. Of course we should uh, start to realize and see ourselves as one species and we should collaborate with each other. And the old dude says, indeed, but technocrats were one of the first to showcase in good detail how technology is replacing human jobs and creating unemployment and how artificial scarcity is maintained to keep the price system money game going. So they could realize that the monetary system um, creates problems and profits out of these problems. You know, if you bomb a country, if you have a war going on in one, one tribe, um, then there are several people profiting off of that. For example, the weapon manufacturers. And then also after the war ended, you can build up that tribe again and that would also increase economic activity. Um, another example is, for instance, the year 1937 magazine exemplified, among numerous other examples, that many citizens of their tribe were dying from water pollution due to improperly installed and maintained plumbing systems and while the cause and remedies were well known, it was not profitable within the money game and thus not a priority for such a situation to be solved. The technocrats said that in the world they envisioned such situations would be approached without interference from any interests but instead with direct focus on the well-being of the citizens. So they really seemed to care about people and they, they understood that okay we need a radical different way of organizing ourselves and put our values not that much into money but into the well-being of all the people except like just like all people but just <laughs> within one tribe <laughs> so in their publications at that time they showcased in detail and in abundance how the technology of that time could work to bring about such a system while also detailing the inherent issues of the profit world. They even proposed that Earth's yearly calendar should be changed to a simple 1 to 365 days numbering instead of how it's currently broken up into weeks and months. They envisioned a world where the workload is reduced to only 4 hours a day and the working class should perform work only between the ages of 25 to 45. They also said that they were not trying to overthrow any government as they represented an educational non-profit movement and it's up to people to bring about the change. So apparently it also seems like they didn't want to have a top-down approach but more to have this educational 
movement going on and to include people instead of forcing something onto them. So it includes economic security as long as you remain a citizen, guaranteed healthcare for everyone, scientists instead of politicians, only citizens can live and work under the system, all people regardless of color can be members of technocracy except those of political posture, use of energy certificates as a mean of tracking resource use and removal of the need for a price system and the creation of abundance. So these are some of the key points, the key aspects of technocracy. The only obstacle is the human animal, they said, as there is plenty of technology and science to obtain a world of abundance for all, but humans are in the way. Their behavior is what prevents this from happening, but their behavior is the result of their environment. They said, okay, now it gets tricky for me to read that. One does not abolish or prevent war by pacifistic speeches or by other means either, so long as foreign trade and the manufacture of munitions of war remain profitable. Neither does one abolish disease while poverty, malnutrition and other disease breeding conditions continue unaltered, nor so long as the economic well-being of the medical profession depends upon the prevalence of disease in profitable amounts. Nor is crime ever abolished either by coercive measures administered by officials whose activities are only slightly, if any, less socially objectionable than those which it is sought to suppress, or by any amount of moralistic railing or inculcation of doctrines of brotherly love, so long as there continues to be offered a standing reward to all those who will give society successfully. Granted, the offer of the reward socially objectionable activities follow as a consequence. Withdraw the reward and these activities automatically disappear. It is the prize system itself, the rules whereby the game is played and not the individual human being which is at fault. So they were really smart, they really understood that you cannot have a, a world of peace where people profit of, from war. You cannot treat everybody well if people profit off that some people are not treated that well. It is profitable for people to not help people. It's like if, if you ask a company, would you, would you give everybody on earth trade-free access to water, to clean air, to clean food, to healthcare, to a shelter, then of course they will be like, of course we, we don't give stuff for free because we need to pay our employees, we need to pay our taxes, etc. So there is a, it's a, it's a structural problem, it's an incentive problem. You know, we, we could of course have in a world of abundance of where we take care of everybody, but companies don't work like that. <laughs> they want to have problems and they want to create problems because they can profit off of these problems. So our world is really twisted and if you realize that you will be like, yeah, interesting. The kid says, yeah, that's, that's interesting. And then the old dude says, um, this group was basically something that communism envisioned, yet they brought science and technology to it. Not saying they were influenced by communism though. They were entirely focused on pragmatic goals. Not 100 types of cars, but one really good one. Not nonsensical stuff, but useful stuff. Not eye candy things, but things that can help you and make your life easier. And the kid is like, okay, but who decides what is nonsensical or useful? I don't get it. Who makes those decisions? And then the old dude answers, well, neither do they, because it's virtually impossible to have an answer to that. As an example, these ideas were picked up by the USSR and China tribes later on, the same tribes that had adopted communism before. But now, years later, they tried to implement a sort of technocracy as well, mixed with other interests and the end result was similar to that of trying communism. A dictatorship, although many of the leaders of the tribes were now engineers or other kinds of scientists. 
It turned out that the engineers were even deciding how many types of toothbrushes should be produced and in what colors. This may be the big failure of technocracy as you observe, even if it was never put into practice the way it was originally envisioned. It demands a rigid system applied to a dynamic society, even if they argue to the contrary. However, their proposals are very clear that their vision was one of pragmatism. Something like what is the point of making blue shoes, purple shoes, orange shoes, red shoes, shoes with a Chewbacca logo on top of them or whatever. Make one pair of good shoes. And of course that makes sense. What's the point of having three million different kinds of cars? Just build one good car, one proper car and that fits its purpose. But then of course you have a dynamic society which means that you have different wishes, different needs from people. And we will learn how the open source um, idea is taking care of that, of that dynamic society and the other ideas. Like others before, socialism and communism, their system poorly defined what they meant by abundance. What does abundance really mean? And we will also look into that in later on in the book. Or also what equal status means. What does equal status for every everybody mean, really? They were thinking in terms of birth control for the population to not exceed the capacity of their resources. This is something that is China doing with its one child policy. And they wanted to measure everything in energy units. Remember back when the guy was talking about energy units instead of money? Which is quite unimaginable as far as what that means in a dynamic world. They also put the power into the hands of engineers, not recognizing that by doing this, it will change the engineers' behavior to where they can transform into dictators or how limited they are in what they can do for the population and by what decisions they can take. The world societies are very complex to try and define and direct through science. Yeah, we will also realize that the world is big and the world is complex. Another important factor is that they had no plan of their own on how to implement such a society, mainly pointed at existing technologies in that period of time that could bring about such a world, but leaving it up to the people to somehow to make it all work. So this point is about they also didn't really have a clear path as to how we can organize society. What, how, how can we implement this technocracy? It is somehow up to the people and we need engineers and scientists, but yeah, how, how, can, we, how can we do that? Um, and then the old dude continues um, with another approach of using technology that is very interesting. Throughout most of human history, gifts and the sharing of all sorts of stuff were a thing. Many humans give stuff for free without asking anything in return. Others share their tool stuff for the same reason. So, for example, yeah, there are, I think I've read some books which were about like um, tribes, for example, in the Amazon rainforest and these tribes, they didn't really had a notion of property or this trade thing going on. It was more, it's more like sharing and, you know, we gather food, we hunt for food and then we share it with everybody. Um, so this more of a communal thing and this is a is a is a thing we can yeah also see throughout human history that people have shared stuff and and gave stuff without expecting anything in return and if we think of food recipes they were always shared modified improved changed reshared again and if you make a pumpkin pie for example the recipe that you use may have been the result of hundreds of mixes of pumpkin pie recipes one may add ginger, others may add sugar, others coconut butter and some others put yet more ingredients. Uh, no owner 
and all of the details for how you can make a pumpkin pie or whatever are open for all to see and use, reuse, share them again. We are used to this today, right? And the kid is like, for sure, I never thought of recipes as belonging to anyone. You're right. The old dude answers, yes, it would be extremely ridiculous to get arrested because the pumpkin pie that you made at home with the ingredients you bought had a closed source recipe that you used without asking the author for that, wouldn't it? And the kid says, yes, that would be outrageous. And the old dude says then, well, while it sounds ridiculous, many recipes on earth today are proprietary not allowed for use, reuse, sharing. McDonald's, KFC, Coca-Cola and probably all food and drink producing companies have their recipes protected in this way. And it's true, yeah. It is like, really? Would you be arrested if you use their recipes? And the old use says, in theory, yes. This is the same exact thing that's happening with software, you know? The coding that allows you to browse the internet on your phone or watch a video on your computer. And the old dude continues, um, this kind of closed source proprietary approach is very deeply embedded into the technology. If you buy a printer or personal computer, you are not allowed to take it apart or change the software even if you own it. In 1983, an American computer programmer was having trouble with his printer. He knew how to fix it, but he was not allowed to touch the software because the software was closed source. That pissed him off to the point where he decided to write a piece of software that will allow machines like printers and other hardware to work, but this software would be fully open sourced for anyone to use, share, modify and reshare. He named it GNU. In 1986, he founded the Free Software Movement, which stated the idea of openly sharing software with a single rule. If you use the free code, you must share any all modifications that you made to this code under the same free rule. So if you took this piece of software and you modified it, you um, improved it, you did some changes to it, then you have to distribute or publish it under the same rule that others are allowed to do so as well. You can even make modifications to the code and sell it in its new form, but you must also provide the source code for all of your software. And the kid is like, well that's a smart dude and that rule seems fair. And the old dude continues, in 1990, back when the internet was mainly a kind of data sharing phone line, simple communication via email, and web pages did not yet exist, a programmer from England invented a piece of software to convert complex lines of code into what we now recognize as a web page, text, menus, images, videos, etc. He made it possible for web pages to exist and to be accessible to others. So this is if you go to Wikipedia, Facebook, YouTube, Google and all other websites on earth. Then it is thanks to this guy that um, yeah, is actually Tim Berners-Lee. Um, it's thanks to this guy that I can see this website as it is. And let's continue. The browsers that you use are what enables this decoding to take place and transforms complex lines of code into the goodies that delight our eyes and this browser is based on what this guy invented and gave to the world for free. By the way, that's the difference between the internet, simple communication, between computers and networks and what became the World Wide Web web pages with, with all of their goodies. Um, then the old dude continues. He released this as free software for everyone to use without restrictions. As a result, it took off and became what humans use today, the World Wide Web, and enabled much more cooperation opportunities between programmers. In 1992, a guy from Finland, which is Linus Torvalds, this guy here, um, took the American printers guy source code and that's uh, by the way that is um, Richard Stallman this guy here 
Um, Linus Torvalds took the American printer's guy source code, which was already much more complex than just making a printer work properly, and made this code much better. We now refer to it as GNU Linux. And there are some people who say you have to say it as GNU Linux. Other people say Linux is fine. Uh, there are also some disputes around that. <laughs> But um, GNU Linux is basically the core software, the kernel that allows all related hardware and software to run properly and it has become the leading kernel used by Earth's supercomputers and servers. And the kid is like, oh wow, so these recipes allowed others to make more and more digital cookies or cakes. So all kinds of, <laughs> all kinds of things. And the old dude says, Haha, ah, indeed, many kinds of cookies and cakes and then so many, so much stuff. Um, in 1998, the term open source was applied to represent this approach where the source of any piece of software is made freely available for to anyone to use, modify, share or any combination of them. This idea, making knowledge free, spread like a virus and millions of people around the world have created a plethora of such projects across all domains. Education, operating systems, hardware, music, photos and videos, programs, open scientific research and anything else you can imagine. So this idea was really like, okay, if, if anybody can take what I created there, any piece of software, like an operating system, then the guy from Australia or the guy from South America can take this uh, piece of software and improve it and can make something better out of it. And then I can take this again and improve it again. And this is like, a, this is an explosion of, of, um, of yeah, development or but now um, the special guy comes in. He's like, sorry to interrupt. That's very interesting though. And uh, the kid is like, who is he? I think he's a special guy, says the old guy. And he says, well, the only thing special about me is that you are all part of me. Sorry to break the party, but I invented all of you to help me more clearly understand how human societies have tried to organize its members for the past 300 to 400 years so that I can make better sense of what solutions there are to properly organize a society. But I need to get out of this story now because we've reached the present and there is a slight flaw in our story. Kid is like, what? <laughs> and of course the guy says, oh, I just asked myself a question again. Okay, so. Imagining how a colony on Mars may be organized is a very good way to put all of these ideas from history into perspective, since many of them, from communism to socialism, technocracy and the like, conceived of their ideas somewhat detached from reality, as if their ideas would be suddenly implemented somewhere untouched by an already existing system, ignoring the present human animal and offering too little details on how to move from what already exists into what they proposed. It's as if they were planning on how to organize people on Mars. Get it? So the thing is, to discuss these ideas is very interesting and also the guys who, who came up with these ideas is just very important because we need to evolve as a, as a human species. But if you're like, okay, we need to implement communism or technocracy, then you also have to take into account all the different kinds of people that we have on this planet. We have more than 7 billion people on earth. We have Hindus, Muslims, Christians, teachers, engineers, artists, people of all ages, tons of different beliefs, many different needs across many climates and so on. We are going to start with these people and we will likely always have this huge difference between cultures so it's best to strive to find a way for how a saner society can emerge out of this. We cannot expect any kind of new global societal approach being suddenly implemented. Reality simply doesn't work that way. And this is also something that I needed to understand because I traveled the world, I've seen all these problems that we face as a, as a global species and I was like, 
yeah, we have all the technology and science we, we, we can change something like from today to tomorrow but that's not how it works this is you know we have more than seven billion people different cultures different belief systems so it's tricky you know and and it takes many different approaches many different ways and we are going to explore this more and more in this book so um i chose to present technocracy and open source sharing economy together because they are in contrast with each other much like capitalism was in contrast with communism and socialism so these last two systems focus a lot on technology and how it is changing society both of them are about how to best harness it but one is primarily centralized and based on experts so this is technocracy and the other one is highly decentralized and based on everyone's input and we have a ton that we can learn from both of them open source gift sharing gives us an opportunity to study how technology impacts a society because it is happening right now under our noses so let's see what we can harness from it and now we're gonna use as a notation free and open source software is FOSS. I mean, this is pretty straightforward. Let's explore the advantages of open source and the gift and sharing economy. The first point is security and reliability. Since everything is in plain sight, everything is open source, thus completely transparent, everyone can examine any project check if scientific and technological research was conducted properly, test if a piece of software has any bad intentions or bugs to uncover, evaluate how well a hardware design can perform or what materials may be needed for a certain hardware to build. All of these and more are available for full inspection. How could anyone take over or maliciously hack such an open source project when all of the bits and pieces related to their project are in plain sight. There is no way to lie about or hide anything within them when everyone has full access to their source code. It is like taking a pumpkin pie recipe, adding some kind of poison to it and then sharing it with the world. Of course, the world will see the poison listed in the ingredients. And this is the... I want to come back to this again because you know, you can ask Apple, is your source code of the iOS operating system open source? Is it free software? No, it is not. And why is it not? Because you make a lot of profit out of your users, out of their data. And you claim to be transparent, but you're not. You're scamming people right in front of their eyes. So let's continue with the second point of the advantages of the open source and sharing and gift economies. Um, creates huge diversity. GNU Linux, as I said, is a kernel, the core software that makes the bits and pieces of a computer mobile function, but an operating system, an OS, is in a way the interface between you and this kernel, which allows you to create documents, browse the web, install an app, watch a movie, use a webcam and so on. Since GNU Linux is FOSS, free and open source software, Numerous operating systems have been developed around it, accounting for a wide variety of tastes needs by the global open source community. For example, the Android operating system that you may have in your smartphone provides an interface between you and Linux, but I also have GNU Linux on my computer within an operating system that is called Ubuntu. The two are very different from each other in regards to their interfaces and other factors, but both emerge from the same core thing. So let me provide an example of how much diversity there is in the FOSS world, in the free and open source world. Before I switch to Ubuntu as my operating system, I was using the proprietary closed source windows and could barely customize anything about it. Plus, every time I needed to add a new piece of hardware, a webcam, a mouse, a printer, etc. I had to install that hardware's related closed source driver software so that Windows could recognize it and be able to manage it. Not installing that additional software would be like putting chewing gum in a toddler's hair. 
If you don't make him aware of it, he will continue with his life without noticing it's there. But there are so many people writing code for Linux that you will find drivers for nearly all types of hardware available out there, so it knows how to communicate with most hardware. No more, no more chewing gum in a toddler's hair without being noticed. Plus, you can make the interfaces of FOSS operating systems, free and open source operating system, look like anything you want to, even mimicking Windows or macOS interfaces, because many people around the world have taken the liberty of editing it in all kinds of ways and you can take advantage of their work. You can also learn how to do that as well. And maybe I can just share um, my screen to show you because I'm using Linux, I'm using Tromjaro, our operating system based on Manjaro Linux. And we implemented a layout switch, so for example I can uh, make it look like macOS. I can just click here and it looks like macOS, right? <laughs> With here the apps on the bottom, um, here this um, taskbar, but I can also make it look like other operating systems we have here. Wait, Windows is this one. So I just type in my password and now it looks like Windows. <laughs> we have the Windows layout. Um, I can also go back to the layout switch and use GNOME-like or top X like yeah let's use GNOME and this one looks like GNOME now but let me go back to the default um, that I'm using. I'm using the default layout switch here um, so this is something which is super cool and it's so easy, I just type in layout switch and then I can choose whatever layout I want to. So I have the freedom to do that. So let's get back to the book. But let me emphasize a very important point here. In order for a webcam to work, when you plug it into your laptop computer, or in order for a wireless gaming joystick to work when it's connected via Bluetooth with your smartphone, there must be a piece of code on your kernel operating system that is able to both identify that thing and make it work. Someone must manually examine the technical aspects of that specific piece of hardware and write code for it in order for it to work. It doesn't happen by magic where any piece of hardware you make will automatically work when you plug it in. The already huge number of various types of hardware out there, plus new ones that are constantly being added, make this a very significant challenge. But the Linux community, people all around the world, are able to quickly write pieces of code for these hardware devices so that they work by default, as soon as they are plugged in. Because there are so many people focusing on it. So. What the GNU Linux community does in regards to developing software for managing a wide variety of hardware highlights one way of creating and copying with diversity. Overall, people create many kinds of programs for the Linux-based operating systems and you can have a look for yourself at OpenHub, which is a search engine for free and open source software. You can, of course, also check out Chrome OS, Unity, Cinnamon, Gnome, uh, Ubuntu Touch, um, Android. Yeah, Android is actually also based on, on GNU Linux. But what Google did is they took over of the work of all these volunteers who developed the software, the Android software, and they implemented their own um, apps on, on it, like the Google Maps, Google Search, Google Drive, Google whatever, and just to, to collect data from you, to collect data from the people for profit purposes. 
and that's why Google is is such a such an evil thing. Their motto was "Don't be evil," but now what do they do? It is a multi-billion-dollar profit company that exploits people, their data, their attention, and so on. Um, and yeah, take the work from so many volunteers out there and exploit it. And we will now look at another example, um, which is called Thingiverse. It's a similar approach for physical objects designed to be produced by 3D printers. So imagine this. Millions of 3D model designs available for printing nearly everything, toys, tools, drones, etc. All of them remixed in so many ways by people around the world. Because they enjoy doing that. Now you have a 3D printer printed by another 3D printer, again all free and open source software. All FOSS. So you go onto this website, search for a drone, download the file on your computer and open it with the FOSS software, print the drone's parts, order the FOSS hardware for it to work, assemble it and now you have a drone. And within the process you can make your drone pink, change the design, add a logo and so on. You can then share your remix with others. All of what you have done is made by no one, yet by everyone. And I think this is just such a cool approach because it, it, it gives you the freedom to, to develop, to invent, to come up with something new, to improve things. And by everyone. It, it doesn't have to be you, but can be anyone who, who does that. And yes, we can check out the... Thingiverse. So here you can see for example a drone um, and I could now for example download all the parts or the blueprints of the parts and then um, print it by myself with the 3D printer and then I have a drone and I think this is just is super cool. Um, let's get back. This kind of diversity and the ability to remix is already built in. You can create far more complex things than many industries can offer. Today's 3D printers are still limited, although you truly can download and print a fully functional drone. See here. Um, but they are continually becoming more and more capable of printing almost anything even electrical circuits and it's not far-fetched to imagine that in only a few years you will be able to print 100% of that drone's parts removing it from your 3D printer as a fully functional drone with no assembly required. This has already spread so much that you can basically make a video that uses all FOSS materials footage, photos, music, the program etc. You can learn for free, write and publish books, make games, build your own smartphone, construct your own computer, communicate, enjoy, teach, whatever. With an internet connection and a few other tools like a 3D printer, it is possible today to access pretty much any service and create many goods in FOSS format. So the diversity is huge. And now combine this with the sharing thing movement where people share their skills and stuff and you immediately end up with a breed of openness and sharing all around the globe, proving that it's possible to create diversity, cooperation and complex goods and services directly within the community without any leaders or experts. The third point of the advantages of open source and the sharing and gift idea. Um, empowers cooperation and redefines education. Today there are many dedicated groups and schools that teach people of all ages, including children, how to create all kinds of stuff via a hands-on approach and it all emerged from or are empowered by the open source movement. Children learn firsthand how to build, test and cooperate with others. Maker movement, hacker spaces and other movements now exist where organized and cooperative humans create a huge variety of stuff. As an example, the largest manufacturer of commercial drones in the US by 2015 rose to that level due to the many volunteers, kids and non-experts who played around with free and open source software and hardware. 
Some of these drones are more sophisticated than some military drones and half of their 180 developers are not experts. I recommend this 50 minute video with the creator of the company explaining the maker movement and their open source drones. This also proves that education occurs better within such communities of people because they get to directly experiment, learn from one another, improve on their own, take risks and have no monetary goal interfering with the progress because they are able to play while they learn and learn while they play. People that are involved in FOSS projects are usually motivated by what they are doing and not monetary gains. And I think this is just a super cool thing because if you focus on not making as much money as possible but to make a really good product then of course the product will be way better if you make something better work if you improve something make it more efficient then it really people are able to create extraordinary things and let's continue with the last point efficiency in terms of resources and energy it costs far less to produce things let's say you want to build a house using a big 3d printer Instead of spending time developing what the blueprint should look like, what materials to use and so on, you already have access to thousands or millions of free and open source software blueprints that you can use. You might decide to integrate a new kind of battery system in support of the already integrated solar panel, but that is 20% more efficient than any previous FOSS models out there. Sharing your updated blueprint for that new invention will cut energy costs for many others who choose to adopt your new model for their own homes. Since it is shared with everyone, research in any domain does not need to be repeated and diverse improvements emerge very quickly from all around the world. What would be the point of me developing a 3D design for something that has already been designed and tested? It's far more efficient to not start from scratch with any kind of project so you can spend that time on improving already open sourced ideas. To take this idea a little further, if the research on a specific disease is made open source, then no one will need to waste time reconducting the same research that has already been completed somewhere else, giving everyone a much better chance at finding a cure or a better treatment because they are starting on the backs of other people's work. So I think these points are very clear, very understandable that if you develop something and you have already something that is open source and that you can use, then you can just improve it and you don't have to start from scratch. And the same with scientific research, with developing things and to me Yes, it's, it's strange that some people didn't get the idea that it's beneficial for all of us if we do pretty much everything open source. But of course there are the commercial interests of companies. No, we want to make money out of that, so we cannot put it open source. So you really also see here that the trade game that we play really hinders the scientific and uh, technological progress of our human species and let's continue in this way all of these processes become faster to develop and integrate at the same time because there are many more people focusing on the existing open source understandings any faults that may exist within all previous research are much more quickly discovered and corrected of course if it's open source then um, anybody can check it, can um, correct things and yes, I think it's, it all makes sense. Um, the open source sharing approach is growing very quickly and provides a perfect example of how people can cooperate and collaborate to create all sorts of valuable things without a monetary incentive. But more importantly, it is a proof of how diversity and complexity can arise from such cooperative groups where being an expert matters very little. It's all based on hands-on developed skills. 
They also provide an example of production and distribution simplicity, eliminating the middleman in virtually all cases. As good as it looks, however, I think it's not sufficient to make a big enough impact in the world and I will explain why. Here are my arguments. And I think um, for this video it's enough and we will continue in the next video with that. I think in this video there are some very important points about open source, about sharing and gifting and what are the advantages, the, the benefits um, if we share things, if we make things open source. Um, but in the next video we will look also um, why these things um, are not sufficient to make a big enough impact in the world. And we will also look into technology and um, the illusion that science and technology alone will create the best society. Because I mean, we have an extraordinary amount of scientific progress and technological development on this planet and we still face so many problems with like social inequality and pollution of the environment, destruction of rainforests and all these kinds of things. So we will look into that in the next um, video. I also personally have to say that this book was really this book was so life-changing for me because I learned so much and I'm still learning so much even if I go through the book right now as I'm doing um, I realize myself how amazing it is to to just like make things open source and to understand the world better because you know if you just read a book about uh, I don't know technocracy then you might get inspired but we really need a very detailed understanding, a better understanding of this planet and of the world and how it works to, to change it. And as we also argue in this book, um, it, is a, it is a progressive change. It won't happen from today to tomorrow. And um, yeah, I can just say that um, that's why I love the Trump project and that's why I will stick to it <laughs> and try to promote this kind of thinking because it really is a new kind of thinking. It is instead of looking on myself, instead of putting my ego above everything, I want to help you, I want to help other people and improve the society. And we really can only do that if we change the game that we play, as we argue throughout the Tron project. All right, <laughs> that's, that's about it from here. Um, see you then in the next video. And as always, take care and much love. <laughs>